Alright, today I wanted to go through, or start to go through, the book of Revelation. This is a combination of research from a guy that I follow behind and do research behind. Uh, he's got a lot of really good knowledge. His name is Robert Farrell. He is Apocrypha1970 on YouTube. Uh, he also has a website called scripturaltruth.com. It's scriptural-truth.com. Uh, and there's a lot of really good information on his website that you can pull from. Uh, this video is going to kind of go behind some of his videos, and all I've done is add some of my knowledge in with it and some verses that maybe he left out or something to that degree. Just kind of building on others' knowledges and, you know, going behind their research and confirming what they've, what they've researched and found. And, you know, God gives us all uh, various things. And it allows us to share with each other and learn from each other and grow in Christ towards each other because there's a lot of deception in this world and this is the age of darkness and uh, the 2,000 years the devil has to reign over us and we, we need to uh, work together and help each other and learn from each other as much as we can to locate the truth and uh, just be in prayer constantly uh, so that we can listen to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that, that she gives us and um, I just want to try and reach out further than I am I have a blog it's it's uh, called seeking his truth blog dot wordpress or at wordpress dot com sorry um, there's a lot of information on there and a lot of the videos that I post I'll also have the the written aspect of it on there for people to just go along and read on their own so if you want to just do that you're welcome to do that um, but I will be trying to build um, videos on YouTube as I go along with my blog. So I hope this is helpful to you, and uh, I guess we can get started. So the book of Revelation is often known simply as Revelation of the Apocalypse. is the final book of the New Testament and occupies a central place in Christian eschatology. Written in Ko Koine Greek, its title is derived from the first word of the text, Apocalypse, meaning unveiling or revelation. The book of Revelation is the only apocalyptic document in the New Testament canon, although there are short apocalyptic passages in various places in the Gospels and the Epistles. The author names himself in the text as John, but his precise identity remains a point of academic debate. Evidence for identifying the author as John the, Apo the Apostle comes from 2nd century writers such as Justin the Martyr Irene Irenaeus, Melito, Bishop of Sardis, Clement of Alexandria, and Mutor, Mutorian Fragment. Other scholars oppose this view, proposing that nothing can be known about the author except that he was a Jewish Christian prophet. The bulk of traditional sources date the book to the, to the reign of the Emperor Dominion and the external and internal evidence tends to confirm this. The book spans three uh, literary genres and these are the three listed genres. Uh, I'll let you guys kinda go through this and you can pause it and read some of this a little bit further. Um, so we can kinda get more over to the actual book itself, but this is just kind of a background knowledge of it, um, what's what's known about it, and where it comes from, that kind of thing. I hope I didn't scroll through that too fast, I'll let it sit for a second, and you guys can pause and read the rest of it. And then we can go and start Revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's see. The book's own introduction to itself is actually the first chapter. Uh, so this is basically just an introduction that we're going to go through and talk about. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to, sh to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. When Jesus was born and circumcised, this is the name he is given as the person on this earth. It's his fleshly name. Um, it's not his heavenly being. 
Christ is what he is in the heavens. This is given through insight and knowledge from the Father on a higher level, um, signified or put into signs and symbols for John. Jesus took three up the mountain with him, James, Peter, and John. And also there were Moses and Elijah there with Jesus standing before James, Peter, and John. These are three different tabernacles, congregations, or pillars of God's people. James is the tabernacle of the Jews. Peter is the tabernacle of Christ. And John is the tabernacle, or is the future tabernacle, excuse me, of God's people, which would be us. Um, at the end of the book of John, John 21, 22, Jesus said, If I want him, John, to live until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. The third tabernacle, John, is, that is spoken of, by name are the sheep that will hear God's voice. The generation of John are the elect, the last generation, which is our generation. So you you have basically time broken up in into three pillars of time, if you want to call it that. Um, you have James, which was the Jews before Jesus coming and the people before Jesus coming. You you have Peter which it was at the time of Christ. Um, there was the... Well, I'll say that in a second. Um, and then you have John, which is the last stage. Um, it's us. It's the people that God is going to pull out the elect now that want to know him, that are seeking after him through this age of darkness. And that it has been completely dark. And the devil has thrown so much deception into this world. And as we go through this, you'll learn more about that just as I have um, just how much deception that surrounds us that we're in every day and for the most part unaware of so um, one of the things that, that I want to point out though before we move forward is you know when, when it, I set up here when Jesus was um, born his name Jesus being the flesh and Christ being the heavenly the one of the verses that really confirms that is the verse where, you know, he's asking, who do you say that I am? And they, they say, well, so-and-so says you are Elijah and so-and-so says you are this. And Jesus asked Peter, who do, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says that it is my Father in heaven who has revealed this to you, which means that Peter had gained heavenly knowledge and heavenly wisdom. He was he was receiving knowledge from God and from the Holy Spirit of who Jesus was, which is what God's doing with us today. He's giving us wisdom and knowledge through the Holy Spirit so that we can know who he is. And he's reaching through even the things that have been distorted to get to us and our prayer life and and our and our life when we when we have our silence with him he'll speak to you if you will just listen but you have to allow silence this world is full of so much noise i mean i used to think you couldn't go down the road without listening to music and now i've decided that i need some time with me and god so on my way to work in the mornings and sometimes even in the afternoons i don't even have a radio on i'm just praying and talking to him and focusing on him and listening Sometimes I just sit and listen, and he'll speak, and he has spoken some very strong and powerful things to me, and it's been very humbling that he would even speak to me, but he's given me a duty. I've been born for this, and I have to press on and, and try to keep my head as focused as possible on him and the things that he needs me to be focused on so that we can all ping off of each other and, and learn and grow and know him better through all this darkness that we are having to struggle through. So, um, let me move forward off all that. I kind of went on a rant there. It says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw? Okay, bearing witness of the word of God um, is one of the functions of the elect, just to reveal it to the people, like I just said. Um, kind of got ahead of myself there. Just what this voice of Jesus is, the shepherd. The discernment can begin so that judgment can begin. This is so tradition can be done away with and so that they can manifest the truth that has been hidden in a new yet old way of seeing. Jesus is the age 
where we see him through the eyes of the flesh, which flesh and blood reveals, and Christ being the age where we see him through the spirit, the father which the flesh and blood do not reveal. The third uh, congregation generation of John is, or the, or the pillar or tabernacle, however you want to put that, um, is there to restore what has, or what was in the beginning. There was an early reign to a later reign. We went from Jesus to Christ, a fleshly understanding to a spiritual understanding. Um, Luke and John speak of this, and the Pharisees were there to take away the keys of knowledge and hidden them from the people. They took what what these words meant on a parabolic level. They took the keys. Jude 12 says, They are like clouds, people carried along by the wind, doctrine, false doctrine, um, but bring no rain, water of God's word or truth. Um, Jesus speaks of the Pharisees as their father is the devil, which is whom whom's will they do so they do the devil's will basically um, he is the synagogue it's the synagogue of satan these men the scribes and the pharisees are the ones who charted out oh these these books are going to be in the bible these books aren't they're the ones who charted this out they're the ones that people are listening to when they say you're not supposed to read enoch and um the book of adam and eve or the assumption of moses or things of that nature these these men, these ones that God very clearly warns us about, are the ones who decided these things back in the times of Jesus. So we should be very mindful of the deception that we have been led to think is the truth, and it's not. They've actually taken the keys of Scripture and the keys of God's knowledge and away from us. So um, it says, read is read Jude one speaks of these false teachers of the past and of today. Um, so you can go and read Jude, because Jude's a very short book. It doesn't take long to read, so I'll leave that to you to read. If you want to stop the video now and go read it real quick, do so. It would be great. Um, uh, but Jude 4 it says, For some godless people have slipped in unnoticed among us, wolves, persons who distort the message, about the grace of our God in order to excuse their immoral ways and who reject Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. So, I mean, we have so many warnings in the Bible itself. Even though they've they've contorted a lot of the scripture, there's still a lot that remains true and a lot that um, is right on, right on for the most part. Um, the only difference that I can tell you between uh, most of the Bibles, because there's so many different translations, is that our Bibles are based on the Hebrew Masoretic text, and the Greek Septuagint is closer to correct, because the Hebrew Masoretic text has been translated, retranslated, they've changed words, they've added vowel points to it, things that weren't in there to begin with. Um, also, you can research this on your own, and I'll probably post something about it at some point, but... Um, the Hebrew Masoretic text, if you put it up in connection with the Dead Sea Scrolls, does not match up correctly. But if you put the Greek Septuagint up to the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have something that matches up almost exactly to my knowledge. Um, I haven't found any errors in it. There's possibilities that there could be something from the translations. But um, that's, that's our source that, that they left us back then. They buried that and put that in the earth for us to pull up and be able to find the truth later on in time when God called for it to happen. So, amongst this age of darkness, God has given us uh, a allotted amount of time to be able to pull up his wisdom and knowledge and see the truth and the facts even on this earth. Not even just spiritually, but he's left us breadcrumbs all over this earth. So... We need to be mindful of those um, as we go as we go along. Let's see, uh, it says they came along and humiliated the Pharisees. This is why they persecuted them, the church, Peter, basically. Um, Paul understood the church to be a threat because they were speaking the truth. Um, John speaks of diatrophies, meaning nourished by Jupiter, and said that he would not accept John or anyone in his church. So these people were persecuting 
the apostles and supplanting them for saying what was true. These people, false Jews and false Christians, were found to be liars. Not thought to be, but were indeed found to be. In the Gospel of Thomas and Luke, Jesus said, The lawyers, scribes, and Pharisees take the truth and hide it. They kill the apostles eventually. Um, it was the only way to keep the apostles quiet from speaking the truth. So they got rid of them. In Luke 11.52 it says, How terrible for you, teachers of the law, you kept the key that opens the door to the house of knowledge. You yourselves will not go in, and you stop those who are trying to go in. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, Do not give what is holy, basically the keys of the mystery, to dogs, scribes, Pharisees, or false Jews, lest they throw them into a heaping dung. Um, and then this refers back up to Luke 11:52. Um, so do not throw the pearls, the keys or mysteries to swine, which is the false Christians, uh, lest they grind it to bits, obliterate, anathemize is a, a, a word that, anathema is a word that is used a lot in technically the Catholic religion. Um, so just if you if you notice a lot of that's going to be thrown in here um, as well that religions are pretty much false they all are uh, even a lot of the Christian per se religions are they're way off base with a lot of things or there's so many man-made laws within them that it makes them almost entirely false because of the way that they see things the way that they think things are, they see it through that that prism. They see what they read through that knowledge. They don't see it for what it is. They see it for what it is through that rule that they made or through that you know law that they made or how they think. That's the perspective that they're looking at things at. You gotta clear your mind of all those perspectives, uh, or else you're just gonna see it the way people are gonna see it through a certain religion or belief. Um, but if you really want to know the truth, you'll, you'll seek it out and God will show you. So let me keep going with the gospel of Thomas. Um, basically obliterate or anathemize the keys of the mysteries, the higher level meaning, the heavenly level meaning, uh, the Christ level meaning, basically. Um, Jesus said, he who seeks will find and he who knocks basically the door of God's word, you know, like in John 10, 9, will be let in. The word of God will open up to him, and he will gain entrance into the kingdom. And just like I said, if you really want to know, you'll you'll find it, and God will reveal it to you. If you really don't want to know, the same thing. If you really don't want to know, if your heart's cold and hard against God, and you really don't want to know, he's not going to show you. And you're going to think there is no truth, there is no facts, there's no evidence in the world. There's tons of evidence in the world. You just have to look a little bit. But, um, I see... Uh, if that is not bold enough warning for you from Jesus, I'm not sure what to tell you. He was letting them know then, and us now, that these wolves have been among us and have distorted his word. We need to go back to the beginning, back to history, just like he has told us to do in the Gospel of Thomas 18. Um, how, can, how can we know the middle or the end if we don't know the beginning? If you stray from the truth, you, you can't find your way back without going back to the beginning, because you will not understand any of it. Um, they, basically the scribes and the Pharisees of old, false teachers of today, strayed from the truth. They came against him and killed him. And yet people listen to the things that they have to say, and have said and done over time. Uh, they let them take the books away, and that hold the keys to the kingdom, and didn't, didn't think twice about it. Some of them have even apologized for all the Christians they killed in history. <laughs> the heartless, soul-bending lies and false truths that spew from their lips are the purest of evil. Sweet to the ears and harsh are deadly to the soul and spirit of the people. If you are of the, of the mindset that your best life is now, pity you. This life has fallen and death is carried with it. In no way am I saying by the way, that we can enjoy we can't enjoy this life 
to the fullest of what God wills for our lives individually. Or that's just purely, or that is just pur purely dreadful. Please don't think that is what I mean by that. There will be a day with no more tears, no more pain, no more fears. Excuse my dog, she's making noise. Um, and that is why I said this is not the best life now. This is what I am referring to in the statement. So if you continue to listen to these false teachers, you will miss all the blessings God wishes to give you. Be mindful, be a Berean. Um, one of the things I wanted to reference to me putting that in there is Joel Osteen. He has that book called Your Best Life Now. We have to watch out for these false preachers. He is a big dude, and a lot of people look up to him or look at him for, for truth and knowledge of God. And he is a false being. He is spewing all about you. It's all about you. It ain't about us. It's about God. I mean, God is about us, but it's not about us. It's about him. He loves us. He's merciful towards us by, by in so many ways. We just have no idea just how merciful and, and how much grace he has for us because of what what is going on right now with us being in the age of darkness. There are so many people that are being led astray, but he's even going to be merciful merciful to many of those because their hearts are for him. There are some that they, they don't understand. They're ignorant to it because they've been led to believe this Christian standard. But he's going to be merciful to even them. And, that, and to me, that's just humbling and should put put you like in awe of him. Just simply that knowledge should put you in awe of him. But uh, you got to watch out because a lot of these preachers, I don't really listen to radio pastors, but I've heard they're just as much as the TV pastors. And I have in the past kind of listened to some of the TV pastors and some of the stuff that they say. Man, they focus a lot on money or you and wealth and riches and great jobs and that they focus so much on you and on this earth they don't focus hardly any and if they do they'll throw jesus christ in there they will but they don't focus on the heavenly aspect of things they don't focus on spiritual aspect of things it's all about you here now what you can get out of this life this is this is not our eternity this is not our real awesome life man if you can imagine being next to your creator, the one that loves you more than any other human could possibly love you, it's unimaginable. It's going to be the most beautiful thing. And that's where really and truly our best life will be. This is a struggle. It's a fight. We're getting attacked by the devil daily. If you love God, you're on his list and you will be and until you draw your last breath. But you just got to keep pressing on. You have to be an overcomer. And if you are going to be an overcomer, God will take care of you. He will be merciful towards you. But you've got to seek out his truth and his knowledge. Um, let me keep on going. Let me scroll up a little bit. It says, um, if everything on earth is shaken, that means all of earthly understanding is done away with. and All religion, all tradition. Uh, let me go off on a rant here for a second. Tradition, Christmas, Valentine's Day, Easter, you name it. They are all pagan from the core. They've put little decorative things on them and made them look Christian and done all kinds of stuff. But man, if you go in and you research it, and I am not even done researching this stuff, you will be kind of like shocked and not sure how to handle that. It's 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 a rough it's a rough pair all of in itself. It's it's a it's a rough bit in itself of knowledge and wisdom that you'll receive if if you research it. And I'll probably post something on that at some point. But uh. It's, it's the truth, man. You gotta you gotta overcome all these traditions. These traditions are masked. They're they're pagan traditions masked as Christian things, and they're way off. Um, and people say, oh well, you know, I've always done it. It's not that big a deal. I have God in mind, but God didn't ask us to do these things. God did not ask us to do these things. He did not ask us to hold these ritualistic activities. He did not ask us to celebrate these times. Him, yes. These toms, no. There's something behind them that's wicked and dark, and people are blinded by it because they're in the dark. So, let me go back to where I was off my rant. It says, it is the restoration of the mystery of God that was hidden by the scribes and Pharisees. If they did it before, they'll do it again. When we try to get the truth out, they will try to stop us. 
the church will want to maintain itself. So the church, a.k.a. the false church, is going to want to maintain itself. These false religions and these false beliefs are going to want to maintain themselves. And if they're not afraid to defy God in the face of knowledge, that is pretty good grounds for condemnation. You defy God at your own risk. Jesus says, if you don't overcome, I'm going to blot you out. We have to overcome this stuff. We have to realize in our hearts and our minds, pray. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe God. I'm asking you to pray and listen and open your heart to God and the truth and what's going on around us in this world. Um, they're going to call us conspiracy theorists at some point. They're going to call us crazy, you know, Bible bashers or whatever, whatever they do. I really can't be called one of those because of who I am, how I am, and the different aspects of me. Because that's just... <laughs> doesn't make sense, I guess, in most people's heads, if you know me. But uh, we just have to overcome this. And uh, Luke 11.52 says how terrible... Once again, I know I put this earlier, but we got to reiterate this. It says how terrible of you, teachers of the law, you have kept the key that opens the door to the house of knowledge. You yourselves will not go in. And you stop those who are trying to go in. We have to be mindful. We do. We have to be so mindful of these things. In Gospel of Thomas 3, Jesus said, should, I'm going to go ahead and read it out, and then I'll kind of explain within. So it says, those, those who lure and lead you say, Behold, the kingdom is up in the sky. Then the birds of the sky will beat you to it. If, you should, if they should tell you it's under the earth, or in the sea, then the fish of the sea will beat you to it. It is rather that the kingdom is both within you and without. Those of you who know yourselves will find out that this is true. When you find out who you are, you will then become known, and will recognize that you are the sons of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and you are yourselves that poverty. So let's go back up here and kind of go through this. The little inputs I got here. I said, should those who lure and lead you say, behold, the kingdom is up in the sky? This is only the religious leaders can understand it. That's not true. Then the birds of the sky, the religious leaders who consume the seed of God's word, will beat you to it, hide the keys and defraud you of it. Just like we read in verse 39, Luke 11, 52. If, you should, if they should tell you it's under the earth, subject subject to earthly or scholarly teachings or in the sea subject to the teachings of the church then the fish um, then the fish of the sea the Christian leaders will beat you to it it is rather that the kingdom is both within you and without you don't need the leaders to see it those of you who know yourselves life light authority and truth will find out through laboring and finding you have to seek after God's word that this is true when you have labored and find out who you are you will then become known in the biblical sense when Jesus becomes you. In verse 108 of the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and will recognize that you are the sons of the living Father. Um, and that's also in verse 6 of the Gospel of Thomas. Um, but if you do not labor and come to know yourselves, you dwell in fleshly poverty and you are yourselves. That poverty, so you are fleshly. If you have the earthly understanding, if you don't even seek after the heavenly understanding, that's what we have to overcome. This is what we have to get past. We have to get past all these earthly teachings and these lies and these deceptions and these twists and these words and these vowel points that have been added to this Hebrew Masoretic text that our Bibles are actually translated off of, which is the wrong text for them to be translated off of. There is so much history to this, and so many breadcrumbs that God's left us, if we would just pay attention. So we talked about diatrophies earlier, so let's move on to that. Um, the meaning of diatrophies is nourished by Jupiter. It says, in addition to being ambitious, proud, disrespectful, and apostolic authority, rebellious, and inhospitable, the author of the letter says that diatrophies try to hinder those during, desiring, excuse me, to show hospitality to the brothers and to expel these from the congregation. He kicked them out, the ones that were known to be apostles. He kicked them out of his church, wouldn't let them stay. So these guys were martyred for us. They did things to 
make sure that we were able to come back to God, that we were able to rediscover the things that God had shown them. For instance, an example, they buried the Dead Sea Scrolls right there. That's something to help us out. They did, they did things. They didn't love their lives unto the death. They died just for us and God. They, they were bound and determined to get God's word out. And they lived for him and died for him. So uh, they will be held in high regard in heaven. And we'll know who they are. So, um, let's see, Adolf von Harnack was the view that Diatrophes was the first monarchical bishop of whom we have the name. In 1588, the Elizabethan Puritan John Udall wrote a dialogue with a haughty bishop named Diatrophes. Writing anonymously, Udall claimed that his godly and witty prognostic Paul was merely cautioning the English bishops to be weary of false counselors, particularly the Catholics, from whom they had inherited the structure um, of English eschatology. Although the dialogue's actual title is the State of the Church of England, laity, opened in a conference between Diatrophes, a bishop, uh, excuse the misspelling there, I guess that's, I actually copied and pasted this, so it's uh, knowledge from, I think, Wikipedia. Um, Tertullius, a papist, Demetrius, a visuar, Pandocius, an innkeeper, and Paul, a preacher of the word of God. It is commonly referred to by scholars as Diatrophes. It says Diatrophes appears to be an influential person, perhaps a leader, in a local church known to Gaius, but to which Gaius himself does not belong. The description of Diatrophes is one who loves to be first suggests he is arrogant and his behavior displays this. He refuses to acknowledge the written communication mentioned by the author at the beginning of verse 9 and thus did not recognize the author's apostolic authority. <clears throat> and furthermore, in verse 10, refuses to show any hospitality to the traveling missionaries, welcomes or welcome the brothers, basically, already mentioned by the author. It has been suggested that the description loves to be first only indicates that Diatrophes sought prominence or position in his church and had not yet attained any real authority, but his actions are suggestive otherwise. He is able to refuse or ignore the author's previous written instructions in verse 9, and he is able to... To have other people put out of the church for showing hospitality to the traveling missionaries. In verse 10, the authority, excuse me, the author extorts Gaius, whom he wishes to continue assisting the missionaries, not to follow the negative example of diatrophies, but to do what is right. There's just kind of a little bit of history throughout that, you know, what diatrophies, who and what diatrophies is known to be. Let's see, 3 John 1, 9-10 says, I wrote a short letter to the church, but Diatrophes, the Pharisees, who likes to be their leader, will not pay any attention to what I say. When I come, the third tabernacle, John, third pillar, us, then I will call attention to everything he has done, the terrible things he says about us, and the lies he tells But that is not enough for him. He will not receive our fellow Christians when they come and even stops those who have to receive them and tries to drive them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is bad, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does what is bad is not of God. This is not a genuine Christian. Um, this is just, this one little paragraph kind of describes how things went then and how they're going to go again. Um, Diatrophies is a representation of the Pharisees, or the leaders or the heads of the church currently. Um, back then, they killed off Christians. There were so many Christians killed, mainly by the Catholic or Roman church at that point. Um, but it's bound to happen again at some point. Because um, these leaders of the church now are not going to want the truth revealed. They are going to do everything they can to stop it at some point so that their church can stand. Um, but here it tells you 
the terrible things he says about us, the lies he tells. We're supposed to call attention to this, and that's our duty, and that's what the group of people that, that I've con you know contacted on YouTube, or that I follow on YouTube, or different blogs that I read, different things that I've learned, and different people I've learned through my research, um, they're all focusing on the same thing, they're all seeking out the same thing. We have to draw attention to these lies and reveal the truth, and what the things of of the standardized church of today, all the things that they're telling us, they're lies. They've contorted them, retranslated them, you name it. Pulled the books out, whatever. Any kind of deception that they can get to say Jesus, but technically focus on the devil, has been done. We have to overcome that and see past it. And it's up to us to do it. We each have a choice. We can either listen to God, listen to His Spirit, pray, discern these things, go out, seek, and research for ourselves, or we can just focus on the standardized Christian beliefs that have been given to us and fed to us um, all our lives, basically. For many of us, all our lives. I, I, I didn't grow up in the church um, entirely. I was in and out of church some when I was younger, so I kind of have, uh, I guess, the children's stories based off of it. And then I started going back to church I think when I was around 24 or so and everything didn't seem to agree and I just kept digging and kept digging for the truth and I went to a Baptist church at that point but I've been to Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian um, I can't remember what some of the other ones were, Lutheran I think maybe uh, several different churches so but they're all kind of drawn close to about the same understanding. They all reject the keys of the mystery. They reject the Book of Enoch, which is in the um, Eastern Orthodox Church. They still have the Book of Enoch in their Bibles. So there's a lot of things that we reject in the Western world that is actually stuff that we need to know. And we're taught to reject it. We're taught not to read it. We're not supposed to read it. Don't read those books. It's going to warp your mind. When we read so many other books, so many other books that would warp our mind, these books would actually help us, but they don't want us to read it. And they want to put as much stuff as they can, entertainment-wise, music-wise, anything else in front of us to keep us away from the silence and to keep us from wanting to seek and learn to know more about God. We have a million and one distractions in our lives. Our jobs, they consume so much of us. So... It's up to us um, in our own spiritual relationship with God to seek out after Him and to, to let Him know we really, truly want to know the truth. And He'll show you. Um, let's scroll down a little bit and keep going. See, blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. In the Gospel of Thomas 33, Jesus said, and I'll read through the red, which is the main verse, and then go through, and we'll discuss it like I did last time. Jesus said, You hear with one of your ears, but the other one you have closed. Preach from your housetops that which you will hear in your one ear, as well as in the other ear. For no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel, nor does he put it in a, hide, in a hiding place, basically, or a hidden place. But rather he sets it on a lampstand so that everyone who enters and leaves will see its light. A lot of the Bible and scripture, because of the things that have been hidden, he has used parabolic meanings and terms to try and hide, but yet reveal it to us. So it's written in such a way that you would think that it was talking just about a lampstand and a light, and yada, yada. it's not. It's talking about us. He's trying to reveal things to us. Letting us know the things that are happening, that are going on even currently. So, it says you hear. You hear the lower level meaning with one of your ears. <coughs> Excuse me. But the other one, which understands the higher level meaning, you closed. It says, preach from your housetops that which you will hear in your one ear. That which has been taught previously. Which, again, I told you I was in... Um, 
sort of in the church, but not really, but I was taught a lot of that stuff. So that, which I was taught previously, the lower level meaning, the earthly level meaning, the standardized Christian meaning. It says that which has been taught previously, the two trees are testaments. Okay, so the two trees are testaments, what we talked about earlier, whether it was James, Peter, and John. They're basically testaments or trees or pillars. It's the same thing. Um, so the two trees or testaments would be James and Peter. So that's previous to us. It says, as well as the other spiritual ear, um, that which was taught at first and rediscovered, the three trees. So that's explaining basically that we have the three pillars or the three trees or the three testaments. Um, we have James, Peter, and John. Once again, we are John. Peter discovered it, but it was destroyed, right? It was cast away, they hid it, they killed the apostles, and we come into this dark age now, and then we get to rediscover it. So, we are now in John's age. We are in the third pillar. This is the third tree, or the testament. But we have to rediscover it through the first two testaments as well. We need all this knowledge to reveal what's going to happen next. We need all this knowledge to reveal what is now. So we need those keys that they've taken away and that have been hidden so that we can rediscover the truth for today, which is God is, is what God's doing today, which is so incredibly amazing. It says, For no one lights a lamp. The Word of God, Psalms 119, 105, read that one, and puts it, the word, the, the word of God is the lamp, it's the light, it's Jesus, under a bushel. Nor does he put it, the word of God, in a hidden place. The word apocrypha means taken away and hidden. They've taken away the apocrypha, and they've hidden it. But rather, he sets it on a lampstand, proclaims it in the church, or Revelation 120, so that everyone who enters the kingdom and leaves the kingdom will see it. It's light, which is the higher level meaning contained in God's word. We need both, really, technically, because God's put parabolic meaning in our lower level earthly books of understanding, and we need that spiritual heavenly meaning from the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to us, to enlighten us, to show us that what is there, basically, what is in our face, what yet is hidden. Um, it says time is at hand, 2,000 years are at hand, there is no opposition. Let's go down. <clears throat> um, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is and was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in our own blood, and hath made his kings and priests to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they shall, excuse me, and they also will, which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so. Amen. It was impossible to fool the elect because they saw Jesus. They were dangerous to the religious leaders of that day because they knew the truth, which is why they killed him. The first begotten of the dead, he was raised from death on the third day as a symbolic as symbolic of the Logos, the blood of the Logos, which is spoken of in Acts of John, the water of the word turned to blood which means that it, it goes into a dead state. It goes from a level of seeing him in the heavenly view to the fleshly state of the Logos, or seeing him as Jesus and not the Christ. The physical death in the flesh is there to prove his love for us because he died and suffered in the flesh. In the spiritual level, when you see in terms of death and bleeding, which is a pattern, which is pattern after his physical death, because the, wor the word dies and resurrects everything the false teachers taught dies with it because everything they did was found on a lie. Then we have the word restored to us in our restoration of the truth is to overcome the world, the traditions of the world. We have to be overcomers once again. 
Um, we shall conquer the conquerors with this knowledge. The knowledge that has newly been revealed to us again, rediscovered. So we exist to debunk or destroy the entire edifice that is called Babylon, which is religion. Judas was there to symbolize there would be a falling away. He was that symbolization because of what he did. Let's see. Goliath had six fingers and six toes, as well as being six cubits tall. Hmm. Number of man, number of age, number of beast. Hmm. Yeah. It's a symbolization, too. These are the things that we have to realize. There's a lot of symbolization in the Bible. So you, you have to look at this as not necessarily... It may be an actual, physically true story of historical things, but these historical things are told and written in a parabolic way This with symbolization to help us understand and to give us knowledge and wisdom of what's coming, what God's trying to warn us about, what's happening currently, what the devil's done. You know, that there are going to be people in this age that are going to deceive us. You know, some things you can take at face value like that. That is straight up face value. But a lot of it is really written in parabolic meanings or with parabolic meanings behind it. So you have to look at it at the, uh, the way the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, too. You can't just look at everything at face value because they wrote it in a way so that we would be able to still decipher things after the Pharisees had distorted them. So with the use of the keys and going back and rereading things and reading those books that have the keys in them and reading those books that we were just told not to read, you're going to learn stuff that you need. Those are things that we need to learn, we need to read. So it says he comes with clouds or Tens of thousands of his saints. Hebrews uses clouds of witnesses. Tens of thousands of the saints. Same thing. Um, the structure that stood to have the apostles kicked out of their church and Jesus killed is the structure that Christianity is built on today. Every eye, spiritual and physical, will see him and know who he is. But they will, they will then be held even more accountable for seeing him. So, that's... Pretty straightforward there, I'd say. Um, we are, obviously, everything is, if you go back and you look at the Crusades and the Roman Church, we're based through the Roman Church. Everything is based through the Roman Church, which is based through Babylon. And it just pings off of it. I mean, you, you can look at all the religions today, and somehow or another has been pinged off of that central point in Babylon. So, religion is not of God. It's the beguilement of God's people, is what it is. And that's a statement that he gave me um, one day when I was in my quiet time on my, on my way to work. Um, it says, Kindreds of the earth are those who are fleshly, those who base their understanding and belief on an earthly level. If you are part of Babylon, a kindred of the earth, this is not going to be easy or good for you because it will go against your belief. So it's not going to be easy. That's... In part, why he says, "I have not come to, I have not come bringing peace, but a sword," because the peace that he brings is, in essence, a sword to many, because it's against what they believe. Their their beliefs are so earthly based and ingrained that what the, when the truth comes, they're going to fight against it. People will fight against the truth because they believe that what they believe is the truth. Man believes man more so than man believes God. It's a struggle. It's a struggle, I'll tell you. It's a struggle to, to take what you've been taught and realize that it's not the truth. That, that was probably one of the hardest struggles I have had so far, is having to even just revert my mind to, to the truth, because I would always want to refer back to what I was taught before, and I'd have to think, nope, that's not it. You know, It's a struggle, but it's a struggle that you will face and have to overcome. All of us will, if we want to get to where we want to go, and we want to be with God. We have to be overcomers. I'm going to reiterate that a thousand times over throughout this whole series, because we have to. We have to be overcomers against this, these traditions and religions of man, um, and God tells us so. So let's continue on. It says, the first vision is a vision of Christ. This is Revelations 1, 8 through 20. It says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord which is and was, 
and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He is calling us to patiently endure the time. We have to be patient. They had to be patient. Their work, they had to be more patient than we do. We don't have as near as long of a time to wait as they do. They had to wait. They What they did would not show or be revealed or rediscovered for 2,000 years. So they trusted in God so much that they did what they did because they knew what he told them that in 2,000 years this would be rediscovered and people would be saved because of it. They trusted in God in that and he, and they did what they were told and that's why we have this chance to rediscover God's truth. So it's because of them and their obedience to God that we have this opportunity um, to get to know God better and the truth of him and look and be able to overcome the lies. So it says he is calling us to patiently endure the time as we are patiently waiting the restoration of the mystery, that which was and is and is to come. John is on Patmos to reveal Jesus the Christ to us. So he's revealing Jesus the Christ to us through Revelation, through his other, the other books that he's written in the Bible. He, he stood tall. He was patient. He did what he was told to do. And thanks be to him for that because we... We needed that, and God knew we needed that this day to, to help us to be able to seek after and reach out to God and know Him and who He is. It says, I was, this, I was in the Spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet. Here's some symbolism in this, too. Here's he's talking about heard behind. That means before. So John was in the spirit of the Lord's day. Six thousand years was given to men. And, seven, and the seventh Sabbath or seventh thousandth year is the Lord's. It's the thousand year millennium spoken of in Revelation. John is spiritually with us. This is why the verse says he is. He heard behind him a great voice. Because the six thousand years are behind him at this point. When he's speaking. So this is basically futuristic to us. In a sense. Um. The voice is great because it is the ultimate or most powerful voice. It's God's voice. It's different from a loud voice. Loud means you are understanding, i.e. loud and clear. And great is authority. It's the authority. The trumpet is the seventh trumpet because he is in the Lord's day. Okay. Saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and without thou seest, and what, excuse me, and what thou seest written in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, supposed to be seven, not sever, um, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So Jesus said he is the Alpha. He is the first reign of Christ in the Omega, which is the future reign of Christ, the beginning and the end. Meaning he will understand him now, today, we will understand him now today. We are living in the Omega aspect of Christ at this point. He says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, or churches, behind him, basically. Because he turned, so they are behind him. These churches are the candlesticks, and he turned, so they're behind him. He sees meaning understanding the voice. Jesus seeing the spiritual opposed to the fleshly aspect of Jesus Christ. The church has been tried by fire and the trials of this age. Because we are in the age of darkness, remember. So we are tried by fire in this age. Um, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girl. In the midst of these seven churches, candlesticks. Jesus has been there the whole time. Christ's heart is pure, tried, and refined in God's fire. He's perfect, basically. Just perfect. Um, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. White purity, right? Jesus has two 
aspects. He is Jesus, and he is the Christ. He is the flesh, and he is also God, coming to do in the flesh what he wanted to be done to the Logos and the Spirit. The fire is there to try and to refine, eyes of flames of fire, his spiritual eye trying us, and the eye of the flesh is trying us. Even a man will be burnt up, but his spirit will be saved. 1 Corinthians 3.15 But if anyone works, anyone's works is burnt up, then he will lose it. But, if, but he himself will be saved, as if he had escaped through the fire. Okay, let's go forward. Scroll up. Then his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Brass is purified in a furnace. Your your feet is your walk, and your walk has been tried. Your spiritual and fleshly walk has been tried. His voice is the secret language, a parabolic language, and water of the word. They couch each other, basically. Like, um... And they have to do with each other. Uh, like, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Light and lamp are interchangeable. They're basically one and the same. The lamp, the word of God, and the candlestick, the church, are the fleshly level or earthly level, and the word of God and the church, or the body of Christ, are the spiritual level. <coughs> this church being the true church, because it is the body of Christ. The sound of many waters, or many nations, people, tongues, and kings. The word as it is treated by many nations, peoples, tongues, and kings. How many different filters or denominations are there? His voice is as the sound of many waters, because you can hear his voice and use the keys to the scripture to understand spiritually what Jesus Christ is speaking to his people. It is in picture language, basically. Um, again, different translations of the Bible, different viewpoints, different denominations, different theological point of views. Confusion. It's chaos out there. You know? So you have to really seek after God. You can't just listen to the man at the pulpit. You have to seek after him. You have to have that relationship with him. It's up to you. You're the only one who's going to face things in the end that you do. You're the only one who's going to face your own ignorance. You're the only one who's going to face your own knowledge. You're the only one who's going to face what you've done in your life, not these men in the pulpit. So you have to look after you and make sure you are learning the correct things. It says, and he had his right hand, let me scroll up a little bit, and he had his right hand, um, had in his hand, his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. Um, basically, the sheep are on his right hand, the goats are on his left. The right hand is his strength. Um, right hand, seven stars, the angels of the seven churches. Hand has to do with your deeds, your acts, or your works. Um, <clears throat> these angels are guided by his hand, and they they carry out his will as he would have them do it. His mouth is his speaking, and the two-edged sword comes from his mouth. Uh, the sword being the word of God. His word strikes on strikes one way and then strikes the other way. Pros, the prospect, the possibility or likelihood of future event occurring, and retrospect um, review of a past course of events or period of time. The going out and coming back, the leading of him and also the returning of him. The sun is the spiritual light, and the moon is the lesser light. The sun is used symbolically. And has to do with seeing things in spiritual terms. You see what other people can't see because you have looked at it in the full light of Jesus or day or the you know uh, spiritual light. You can see things because you've been given wisdom by the Holy Spirit to do so. Uh, countenance means seeing face to face. The people who are elect or chosen are going to want to bring their works to the light, and the people who are not will want to hide away from this light of Jesus. He's going to be so great, and the truth is going to be so great that they are going to tremble. They are going to be afraid of him. Um, because they're going to realize that what they have believed all along, that what they've fallen for all along, is the deceit of the devil, and it's going to scare them. Because they're going to realize 
what light and who they stand with, which they stand in darkness, so there is no light. So they're going to realize who they stand with, and that's going to be a very scary moment for them. Okay, let's move on now. It says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. It says, seeing him face to face, that's powerful, right? So even Peter ran from the light when he confronted him about his denial of him. Peter knew he was wrong. John here can't take Jesus can't take Jesus looking at him face to face, so he falls at his feet dead. Jesus laying his right hand on him is putting the seven stars or angels. Um, angels and churches. Responsibility of the churches into John's hand. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, You are looking for the end. You have found the beginning then. Just like I talked about a while ago. We have to go back to the beginning. You're looking for the end, but yet you don't know anything prior to to know exactly what's going to go on in the end. We have to start at the beginning. So if you stray away from something and the object is is to get back to um, and the object is to get back to it, excuse me, you can look all you want. To, but if you don't look back at the beginning, you will never get back to it. You get lost in the woods, but you know just you know some certain point to get back. You're not going to retrace all your steps back. You're going to go straight to it. You know if you start veering off the wrong direction. So you have to go back to the beginning. So the Gospel of Thomas 18 says the disciples said to Jesus, "Tell us how our end will be." And Jesus said, "You have discovered in the beginning." That you look for the end, for where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He, he will know the end and will not experience death. Let's go back through it again like we have been. You have discovered in the beginning that in the beginning the New Testament writers believed in scriptures outside of the canon. They did not just believe in... Genesis the Revelations. They believed in these other books too. They quoted from these other books in their writings. Jude quotes Enoch. I mean, there's other books in there that quote Enoch too. There's other books that quote the Assumption of Moses. There, there's so much more to this than than we are told we can read and are allowed to see. It says them um, that you look for the end, some better than that simple fact. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> For where the beginning is, the basic fact of their use and belief by the New Testament writers, there the end will be, the return to the original understanding. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning and will stand with the New Testament writers. Have to go back to them. They were there before us. They understood things better before us, before things were hidden. Oh. He will know the end, the return to the teachings, and will not experience the death of the mystery. Because they didn't have to experience that. That didn't happen until the 2,000 years. <clears throat> it says, so, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. In the physical sense, he lived and dies as a man, and he is alive forevermore as a man. But the word, him as the Logos, Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. The dwelling of him among us was also, parabolically speaking, the physical flesh, man, Logos, word of God among us. So he dwelt among us as the book of Revelation, the word. <clears throat> we didn't recognize it. He was dead as the Logos. The true meaning of the word was also dead. And it, it is as at the last time, the 2,000 years to the millennium transition, <clears throat> excuse me, that he is the last. What they have built their kingdom on, and we can, and we can destroy it and reveal to them the truth. Now he is giving us the keys, power and the truth, to destroy hell and death. Now we have all the keys to unlock all the evil that has been done in the past. He has set them up and laid a trap for every unclean bird or false leader. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what was I going to say here? Um, he was dead as the Logos. True meaning of the word was also dead. 
I may have just lost my train of thought. Well, I guess, I guess that'll be enough because I can't remember what I was going to say there. <clears throat> um, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Um, the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. So I'm just going to stop right here, um, and I'll start my next video here in Revelations 2. Um, so I hope this has been helpful. Again, I ask that you guys go out, research behind me, um, go look at uh, Robert Farrell, scriptural truth or scriptural-truth.com. Um, look at he's got a lot of free PDFs on there of these books that we were told not to read. Book of Enoch is on there. There's many other books on there. Um, you can get another book I would suggest is the Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. It's got a lot of the early um, church fathers basically. And, and I think some of their, their stuff is right on, some of their stuff is a little bit different, but it, it all is going to lead us to the truth, because every, everything that is truth is going to connect. And you need to pray on it, you need to ask for discernment from God over these things. Um, you can't just listen to me and think, oh, I got it all. You, you've got to go back behind me, you've got to go research it, go look into it. Uh, Read these books. These books are what gives you these keys so that you know what's going on so you can read deeper into the meanings of the things that are in our accepted canon. So, <clears throat> I pray God would, would help you guys through this just as much as he is me. And I um, uh, hope you'll come back and listen to uh, Revelation 2 and so on as I go along with this. And I hope that it will be helpful for you. So. God bless. Have a good one.